are listening to the most original talk radio station anywhere. We are LA Talk Radio at latalkradio.com. You're listening to Fouché Way with Brandon Fouché, right here on LA Talk Radio. Well, hello, and welcome to the Fouché Way radio show, live every Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m., sponsored by the nonprofit organization called Canine Hope for Improvement Program, where we hope to improve the quality of our dogs' lives by moving towards a no-kill society. The number here is 818-602-4929. You know, I used to say that I am not for everybody with their dog. And that if you're not having an aggressive problem, then you generally don't need me. Well, I've said this so much now that the people that I have helped over the years tell me I'm wrong. They say that if they had known me before they were having problems, they wouldn't be having them now. And that's true. But back then, they couldn't accept giving up the toys, balls, rough housing, tug of war, and so-called playful predatory games, they couldn't believe or entertain the thought that this could be the source of their problem because it would require you giving up what makes you happy. And because we feel our dogs enjoy killing the ball and killing the toy by chasing an inanimate object, we say they love it because they're predators. Well... (laughs) We got some people predators out there right now preying on people and enjoying it too, I'm sure. Doesn't make it right. (laughs) You see, someone interfered with them at an early age that twisted their minds to become devious and aggressive. We can also interfere with our dog's mind at an early age and twist it to become devious and aggressive with the things we do with them. For an example... Some people can experience pornography and let it pass them on by. And others can experience it, and the look on their face is like a deer in headlights. They're just stuck on stupid. What I'm really trying to say to you is that we have to look at the things that we do with our dogs and determine if what we're doing is making them a better member of society. What is the message that we are sending? Most of our dogs have learned helplessness because what they are learning is not helping them. It's actually producing, nurturing, and feeding a desire that should lay dormant. They don't need to practice predatory skills to be happy. We were led to believe that they do, but it is not true. This can be explained at any time. It's not difficult to expose it. All we ever offer them is to enhance their hunting skills. What do we expect for them to do? And how do we expect for them to respond? This is what we are teaching them, to kill, to be aggressive, to be assertive and dominant. Why are we surprised when they react in this way? The difficult part in this is that we have adult dogs that have been interfered with, and this knowledge has not been revealed until now. And the truth is, we have been asleep for so long, it takes the actions of an aggressive dog that we love to accept this new way of thinking. And I'm not going to be naive about how long it's going to take for people to change. It's going to be a process. Look how long we have accepted what we have now without anything to challenge it. Now, one person stands up and says, our present system is wrong, and we're going to rush to change. I don't think so. That's why I come to you with this truth, so that you can let this truth be the basis at which how you judge how you're going to practice positive reinforcement with your dog. The concept of how humans think or the way nature intended them to process information, a more organic way. And based on how you practice it, this will represent what is considered to be positive reinforcement that will use as a guide so that your dog won't misinterpret your intentions. But you've got to want it bad enough. So today, we have people who want to give up their dog, who has given up their dog, 
and those who will be giving up their dog. And I thought it would be interesting for you to hear their story. It's a different kind of journey they are about to embark upon. And so my first guest is a husband and wife named Frederick and Caroline. How are you two doing today? Very good, thank you, Brandon. Good. You know, you um, you have a, a dog named Wrigley. Can you kind of tell our listeners, um, you know, their your journey with him up until the time that you came to see me? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Brandon, for giving us this opportunity and helping us out. You're welcome. It's a huge help for us. You're welcome. Um, but let's start by saying that we, we found Wrigley at a shelter in uh, San Pedro uh, back in January mm -hmm. or February. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was a extremely beautiful, calm, um, wonderful dog. So, um, and he still is. But we took him out of the shelter and we brought him home. And um, Ripley, in the first week, was extremely calm. Um, a little hesitant to do new stuff, uh, a little suppressed, a little scared. But after a week or two, he got his mojo back. Mm -hmm. And... Um, just kind of circled around in the house and, and liked being there, felt very comfortable, um, extremely calm all the time, and, and very loving. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to be petted. Mm -hmm. um, Ricky looks like a, a mix between, or he looks like a lab. Or he is a mix between a lab and a golden retriever, and he had a bit of chow in him. Um, so after some weeks, um, suddenly we saw that he one day bit one of our or our nephew um, snapped out after him and, and bit him a tiny tiny little bit um, when he was feeding him, while he was feeding him um, we didn't take much notion of it um, we continued to play with Rickley and, and uh, do what we used to do um, I have I love to go do everything with Ricky. I take him on the boat, I take him mountain biking, I take him running, I take him to football practice, um, I basically take him everywhere. So um, within the next couple of weeks after that, we noticed that if he got scared, he would snap uh, after people. If I was walking on a, on a dark street at night and somebody would run past, he could um, make a quick snap at them. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily touch them, but you know you could hear the teeth go up. Um, so and, and if and we noticed uh, sometimes if he was tied up uh, somewhere and people would approach him, he could also snap. Mm. Um, we didn't have any big issues about it, but but we noticed that it was taking place. Um, Ricky loves to hunt. Um, Rickley was, every time we would open the gate, Rickley would walk out and see if he could find a squirrel or a rabbit or uh, a lizard or something. Anything that moves make it, grabs his attention. Um, so I was doing that a lot with him. I was actually walking down the street and enjoying watching him um, take a run after the squirrels. Mm -hmm. um, so suddenly one day, uh, after three or, three or four months, um, we had an episode where a little girl um, ran past him very quickly. And Rickley would be sitting very calmly next to me, and suddenly he would just turn around and snap the little girl on the shoulder. Um, some of us said that, he, that the girl stepped on, her, on his tail. Um, I, I'm not quite sure, but bottom line is the girl got a little snap or a little bite on her shoulder. Um, Again, nothing came out of it, and, and we started training him to sit and to stay and all those kind of things to get him a little bit more in control. Um, Ricky is ex extremely well-behaved. He never makes any issues at home. He can be alone all day, and he would never bite in a shoe or anything. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a very calm and intelligent, relaxed guy. So... Um, Eventually, uh, we, we took him to, uh, one day we took him to a, a party, a, a pool party, and um, after he had been playing around with, with other dogs and, and some of our friends and, in the yard, I took him out and I tied him up next to the car in the shade. In the yard, though, he had the muzzle on, by the way. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had put a, we had 
trained him to walk with a muscle just in case we were a lot among a lot of people. Um, so in this case, we had the muscle on him. Um, as he was sitting there next to the car, one of our friends who does not know the dog walked out to the dog um, and thought he was such a good-looking and cute dog, so he started petting him and gave him a hot dog. Um, and Ricky, at this point, the muzzle was off, right, Frederick? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, correct. The muzzle's off. So Ricky, yeah. the muscle was off, yeah. I'd taken the muscle off him um, as we walked outside of the yard because nobody was... I didn't expect anybody to go out there, and even if they did, I was sure that nothing would happen. Um, so Ricky takes the hot dog very gentle as he is. He takes the hot dogs from, from my friend and puts it on the ground and doesn't want to eat it while while my friend is standing there uh, watching him. So he just leaves the hot dogs on the ground, and my friend kneels down um, to him. And as he kneels down, the dog, or Ricky, suddenly launches after him and bites him uh, on his nose and above the eye. Mm-hmm. Um, it goes extremely fast, arm. and it hits him on the arm as well, yes. So that made Carolyn and I, of course, extremely scared and, and uh, didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we were, at the time, we were convinced that we could probably not have the dog. Um, this was um, too dangerous. And um, so so we started looking around um, on what to do. And as we contacted friends and family and, and rescue organizations, um, we stumbled upon your name in several occasions where you were recommended many different places. So finally we gave you a call and said, hey, we have a dog and we're not sure if we can keep him. Uh, he's, he, he's kind of dangerous. Um, what is going on? Uh, do we have to put him down? Mm-hmm. All right. And um, so you came to see me, and, you know, what did you think after we talked and after you saw the video and with him and I together and based on my evaluation? I mean, what were your thoughts? Uh, my thought was clearly that you have a very good point um, in the sense that I have trained and I love to see Ricky hunt Mm -hmm. and I have encouraged that hunting instinct in him Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and it does make sense that a that a dog with an alpha personality like he has even though he he looks so cute and looks so gorgeous um, he has to be treated in a different way than a than a very submissive and and happy golden retriever yeah I want to stop I want to stop you there he's not an alpha this dog is not an alpha, okay? Okay. And uh, I don't want people to think that. He's not an alpha. Uh, he's basically a beta. And he's the kind of dog that um, doesn't necessarily have to play. He's a tolerator. But he's a sweet, loving dog, okay? And so, yes. you know, once I evaluated him to see, I wanted to see how long it was going to take him to be comfortable with me, you see? And based on the video, we put it up on Facebook, we can see him all over me. So this is really a sweet dog. But we have to get into the areas of thinking about the environment that the dog is in. See, when you tie a dog up, and I'm sure you've heard of fight or flight syndrome, right? Have you heard of that? Yes. Okay. When you tie a dog up, you take away one of those options. And that's the option to flee. That's the flight. And so they fight. Because someone is coming into occupied territory. And anytime you're coming into occupied territory with an animal that is caged or cornered or tethered, then you may be subject to discipline. And so basically, each one of these times, these incidents that you've had, had been where he's been on a leash. I think there may have been one where he wasn't, but mainly everything has been on a leash. Yeah, I think everything has been on a leash, right. leash, actually. Exactly. And so when you walk your dog, and you allow for him to walk in a predatory mindset, and you were producing that in him, because you enjoyed seeing him 
hunt. And most walks that people do with their dog is a hunting expedition. We think that if we walk them in a way that they're going to in some way smell the flowers and enjoy the walk. But what they're smelling and thinking in their environment are the scents that other dogs have left behind that are not nice. The messages are not nice. And so he's in this predatory state of mind. You are encouraging him to chase whatever small creature that's out there, and you're enjoying that. And he is becoming more and more of a predator than everything that is within his mindset is of a predatory nature. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so everything he sees, everything that is in his view is subject to prey. And I've talked about this before that our dogs see their environment as prey. But dogs that actually live in the street see their environment as a predator. And we as owners of dogs, must help them to see their world as a predator when we are out in public. We have to allow for them to see that. Now, on the, the, the other hand of chasing uh, prey, you also play tug of war with your dog. Right? Yes, a little bit. Not a lot, um, but a little bit. To be honest, Ricky is mainly a guy who um, wants to be petted and just be calm. He's not a playful dog. He doesn't want to run after a ball when I pet, when I throw it. He doesn't care for um, for you know biting in a in a artificial squirrel or anything like that. Um, he's at home. He would just walk around and only if if a rabbit or a squirrel or something like that comes into his into his vision. That's when he would get excited. Everything else he's very calm about okay, and not but, super playful about. All right, but listen to what I'm saying. This is very interesting. I want everybody to hear me because I know you love this dog, but I want you to yes. hear where you are playing this down. You're playing this down. You just said you like to see him hunting. Right? Yes. You, you enjoy seeing that, right? Yes. Okay. So you are producing that within your dog. That gives you joy. That energy is transferred to your dog. Okay? And, yes. And you have played tug of war. doesn't matter how much you have played it, right? Yes. Okay. So when you play it, you are actually saying something to your dog. You are relaying a message to your dog. And at the moment that you do that, he is trying to figure out the reason for what we consider this to be a game, what this meaning is that we're doing this, okay? See, dogs are yes. learning whether we are teaching them or not. So it's important that what we put in their mind is something that we want them to to use as a life lesson, okay? So if you do play tug of war, you are asking your dog to challenge the one that is supposed to be his leader. And so you have Thank already you. lost because you've asked him to challenge you. Do you understand? Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is really, really important to get this down. We can't think that when we play this game just a few times, that at some point or for some reason the dog forgets that we actually did that or that that thing had a meaning, okay? And then we're on to something else. It's like trainers who say that you can play tug of war with your dog as long as you win. Well, you have already lost the moment that you say challenge me in the psychology of the dog's mind. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. And so we're developing these concepts within our dog. So we are actually developing and producing the type of behavior that ultimately we don't want. See, to the dog, this is not a game. These are life lessons. So if I can challenge my owner, then I can bite a human being that I don't know. If I can chase an inanimate object as though it's prey and grab it, 
then I will use that in other areas of my life with things that are moving. And, and I can say things because when we throw objects, which I know that you said he didn't participate in much, but when you throw an inanimate object, that's a thing that we are producing a real emotion towards, which is a predatory emotion. And then when a live creature behaves as the ball does when we throw it and the dog chases it, then they say, ah, this was the purpose of the lesson that my owner was teaching me. You understand? Mm -hmm. And this is where we start to go wrong. And so behaviors that we consider to be what we don't want is actually something that we're producing, but we really don't want the dog to do it. So when the dog is tied up because of how he feels about people, when people approach, because all this dog does is think about prey-driven things, then I'm going to look at that person approaching me as prey. That's what I'm saying. I had a gentleman once, I, I, I may have told you this, a friend of mine who, um, he, he does the, the uh, fighting in the ring, mixed martial art, I believe we call it. And one day his son was at school and he got a call back that his son had hurt someone. So I was with him. We went to the school and uh, he was all over his son, but telling him what was wrong that he was doing. And I said, hold on, man. I mean, you take your son with you to your meets on the weekend and he sees you choke people out. You don't think that he's not going to choke someone out at his school? This is a life lesson. He sees his father doing this. You can't be too hard on that kid. You're just going to have to do a lot more work for him to understand why you're doing what you're doing for a living. And so when we do things with our dog, we are actually saying, son, if it's a boy, and daughter, if it's a girl dog, this is what... Uh, your job is in life. And that's where we go wrong. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so now your, um, your wife is experiencing these things along with you because um, you know she's a part of the family. And so Caroline, what are you seeing and what are you thinking? Um, initially, I mean, I mean, like Frederick said, initially I thought we had to put him down or we definitely couldn't keep him because this is too much of a risk for us. Mm -hmm. And then we got a little more, like the situation gets a little further removed and we could be approached, maybe there's something we can do, et cetera. Mm -hmm. He also listed him on Pet Finder and those kinds of places because we didn't think we could keep him. And then we kind of have taken a week or two where we're like, maybe we're going to keep him. But this, just this week is hitting me again. I, we can't keep, as much as I love him, and I think he's an amazing dog at home, and he's so sweet and quiet. He doesn't bark. I mean, I love that because he's just an easy dog at home. Mm -hmm. But we can't take that risk. It's too, it's too much of a risk for me, uh, for us. And I also think um, if we ever have kids, I'm never going to feel comfortable with this dog being alone with a, with a baby, with a, with a toddler. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to have to be on alert for the rest of my life because of Wrigley. Okay. Yeah, this is a serious thing because, you know, I mean, you're really contemplating you want to give up this dog. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show because I want people to hear your story and I want them to know Wrigley and see the video. He is a very good-looking dog, perfect-sized dog. Um, he is a very sweet dog, he's a very loving dog, and uh, he got along well with all of my dogs. I think he's a great dog, and I want people that are out there that are thinking, hey, I want to learn how to work with dogs that aren't really that much of a problem and be interested in maybe adopting him if you guys really get to that point uh, where it's actually happening. That's why I wanted to have you on the show. Now, more importantly, for people that are listening, people that are listening, after you've come to me, Frederick, how yep. is that prey drive now? Well, so so we did some of the things that you recommended, or we did all the things that you recommended us to do, Brandon, mm -hmm. and it has changed a lot. Now, when I walk with Ricky, he always walks behind me. Mm -hmm. um, he his drive is has when we walk, his his prey drive is completely gone. Okay, he's walking behind me, and he's keeping focus on what I'm doing, mm -hmm. and. He, He's just calm and doesn't run for squirrels or 
or lizards or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's way more focused on what I'm doing than he's focused on what's happening out in nature. Okay. Good. Um, in, before he would always walk ahead, he wouldn't pull the leash because he doesn't do things like that, but he would walk ahead of me and always be the one watching out what is coming, what's happening next, the birds, there are sounds that's unusual. Mm-hmm. And now he's not, now he's just walking behind. Right. Um, also at home, we've seen him calm down. Sometimes if a squirrel would be sitting outside of the window, he would sit on the other side and he would like look for hours and hours and I couldn't get his attention. Now I can call him over even if there is a squirrel sitting on the outside. Mm-hmm. I can call him over and, and snap him out of that um, that state of mind. Mm-hmm. Um, I have not yet had him out of the leash and done all the things that I did before. Um, but but I, I think I would have more control over him now, even without a leash, mm-hmm. um, if that was the case. Right. But... Yeah. Um, but now that he's not going to, you know, you have recommended or you have told us not to let him chase or, or hunt anything, then uh, that's, of course, not going to be an option. Right. Yeah, what you're doing is you're putting in his mind what you want him to think. And that's what leaders of packs do. They don't allow other members to make decisions about what the pack is going to do. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and they don't do that because they're not trying to allow for them to just enjoy being a leader. Because that's what we're saying. You know, dogs want to know, am I leading this pack or are you leading this pack? And if we express our love to our dog, we have a tendency to allow them to do what they want to do because we think that we're expressing love to them in that way. But that is not what they want. They want to be told what to do because they're pack animals. Their life is based on hierarchy. And I think the fact that you've come to see me one time and already you have controlled this, this is just an example of how far that you can go with this dog. Now, the danger, the danger is real, but the fear and and how you allow the fear to affect you is where we're having a problem here. And this is what Caroline is going through. This is the liability. Uh, she's already projecting, you know, if we have a child that something might happen and blah, 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 blah. That's a fear that has become a reality in her life. I understand that you're going to be having some people that are be, going to be coming to stay with you for a while. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, two of my friends are coming over for two weeks mm-hmm. um, to stay in the house, and um, and because I feel I feel so confident that Ricky is comfortable with people that he knows a little bit, mm-hmm. like you, yourself, Brandon, or mm-hmm. uh, people that come over to the house that he has seen before, has never been an issue. It has only we've only seen anything when it's strangers approaching him when he's tied up. Yeah, that's where we. That's where we've seen the issue. Right. So I, of course, am so comfortable that these people can come over and they can stay in our house and, and we don't need to wear the muscle inside of the house. And, and But if, Carolyn, of course, is looking at the risk from a different perspective and, and is very concerned about strangers yes. being in the house for so long and us not being there all the time. Well, I'm going to tell you, this is a very intelligent dog, okay? Intelligent dogs think in a way that's like humans, okay? Uh, Meaning that, you know, if your child is out or if your child is somewhere and and someone approaches them, we want them to think that maybe this is not the right thing to do, okay? To not go with strangers, to not allow people to touch you. That's kind of how Wrigley is. He's saying, hey, I'm tied up here. I don't know you. Don't come and physically handle me, Okay? Stay away. And and really, that's what people should do. But people feel that if there's a dog tied up, then they're supposed to go over and touch them and love them and say hello to them because every dog loves them. I mean, that's how I got mauled when I was a kid, thinking that very same way. And that's not the way that we should be thinking. And then there are dogs that say, fine, if you come to my house, you can be here or be a part of everything that's happening because this is my owner's house. That's an intelligent dog. And you've got dogs that are subordinate that just really don't care who touches them, want to be touched by everybody, 
and, and will be led anywhere with anyone. You can untie them and take them off and, 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 and rescue a dog if you say if you speak that way and or steal a dog, man. And most subordinate dogs are done that way. And I've got dogs that are just not gonna let you touch them if I'm not around. Because they're very intelligent dogs. Okay? But this is not the kind of dog that society is used to because breeders bred for subordination. So we bred for a dog that could be accepted by anyone. And so this is difficult for humans to, to understand. And, and that's why this show is here, so that we can talk to people about what they should and should not be doing. Yes. I, what I'm going to say for this next two weeks, I think that you should use this muzzle with this dog at home and let your guests be the one that tell you they feel totally comfortable with that dog because of his actions with the muzzle on. You see? That's how you're going to know. It would be irresponsible of you to have the muzzle off with your friends thinking that the dog was fine without the dog proving that he truly was. And, and that's the fear that your wife has. And that's a, that, that's danger is real. So in rehabilitation, we always set the dogs up to fail, meaning that we prevent them from doing the thing that got them in the problem in the first place until they show us that they're able to accept and do what, what it is that we want to, to do. This is called setting them up to fail. And in rehabilitation, it's usually a two to three week period, sometimes longer depending on the situation. You have a perfect situation there for the next two weeks uh, to make sure that Wrigley's safe and that these people are safe, but the muzzle allows for them to interact. And then after that two week period, I definitely want to report back. And even during that time, which is the reason why you're on the show, we want people that are interested in him that would say, hey, you know, this is the kind of dog that I want because he is really a good dog. I mean, I wouldn't say he that really if is. he wasn't. Yeah. And so I, I want to say this to people that are listening. If you're thinking about a, a dog, take a look at this guy. In fact, is there a number, Paul, I mean, uh, Frederick, where they can call you if they're interested in him? Yes, certainly. They can call uh, 310 mm -hmm. 697 Nine eight nine zero. That's my cell phone number. You can call day and day or night, mm -hmm. um, and I'll be happy to explain everything that's going on okay. in detail. Fantastic. And uh, they can always go back to the show and listen for the number two. But uh, Caroline, yes, I know that when you came, I don't know what you thought when you came to pick up the dog, but uh, I don't know what was in your mind, but. <laughs> You know, I, I really I evaluate people at the same time when I'm evaluating dogs. And I could tell right. that you were kind of hesitant. And sometimes when people are like that, either they're not really dog people or they've really got a lot of fear because of something, you know, really bad has taken place. And um, I'm going to say maybe both with you. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. You know, um, I'm going to ask uh -huh. you to do something. I mean, you got time. I, you know, the ultimate thing is, look, you got to at least do this two weeks unless someone comes along. Because you know if you take this dog to the shelter and you tell them what yeah, has taken place, he's dead. And that's mm -hmm. not what you want for him. You know? No, it's not. But I also feel like we've taken one too many risks this time. You know what I mean? We, we it's, it's gone too far. You know, like it's gone too far. And even I know that... The, only way we know if he's better is for him not to do it again. Right. But to take that risk and the chance that he's going to do it again is too much for me. Mm -hmm. for, for two reasons. Like, I don't want anyone else getting hurt by Wrigley, and I don't want to have to pay for anyone else getting hurt by Wrigley. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right. I mean, that's fair. Um, well, you know, Frederick, you know, you got a responsibility there to, to make Caroline feel secure. you got to wear that muzzle. You got yes. you got too much to lose if you make a mistake. And up until now, you've only made mistakes by not understanding how your dog thinks. Okay? Yes. I just, I just want to tell you that. So I want to I want to thank you for coming on. And of course, I I would love to stay in contact with Wrigley and and people. If you're interested, please give me a call or give Frederick and Caroline a call in regards to him and. 
you know, I I hope to see you uh, again, and I would like for you to be a part of taking the hikes uh, in Griffin Park, you know, with a group of people that do that a lot. I know you like to hike, uh, Frederick, and take advantage yes. of this, okay? You're doing the Fouché way now. Things are going perfectly now. Let's keep it going, and I want to check back with you in another week or two, okay? Sounds good. All we'll right. be there for sure. Beautiful. Thank you very much for coming on, Caroline and Frederick. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Brandon. You're very okay, welcome. take care. Thank you very much, Brandon. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye. My next guest is bye-bye. Paul. Paul, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. Okay. You've got a beautiful dog. You want to tell people about your dog, uh, Yoko? Yeah. yeah. Um, y- Yoko's a, um, a rescue bull terrier. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when we got her, she was uh, a year and a half mm-hmm. old, and we got her from... Um, I think the Bull Terrier Rescue of California, uh, of Southern California, it's uh, out in the desert. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Do you want to just tell what happened, basically? Yeah. What's what's been going on? I mean, you know, is this your first time dog owner? No, no, no. We had uh, we had we had two dogs previous, and um, we had one dog for 15 years, and, and another dog simultaneously for 10 years. Okay. And they both passed away within about a year. Mm-hmm. And at that point, um, I thought I was not going to have a dog for a while. And then I just really, then I decided that I was going to get the dog I always wanted, which was a, a bull terrier. Okay. And how is this um, one different from your other dogs? What did you experience? Uh, we had a we had a Scottish terrier. Uh, she was a uh, super sweet, uh, pretty easy. Dog and we had a a, a mutt that was a um, the blue healer mixed with a toy fox terrier mm-hmm. and um, she was uh, she was very good for most of his life but towards the last third he got he got kind of neurotic and um, and grumpy and uh, and did actually like fight one of my friends you know, he was never aggressive towards us mm-hmm. he just been like he became like non social animal. But, um, he used to be, I mean, he was brought up as super social, going to everything, and he was great, and I don't know exactly what happened, but we still loved him okay. um, to death, so when he passed away, that was, that was the last one that I said I, was, I really wanted to get a bull terrier, okay. and my girlfriend works at a, or used to work at a, um, a cageless uh, uh, daycare, mm-hmm. uh, it's not cage-free, cage-free mm-hmm. daycare, right. where you know, dogs were just roam, yeah. So I thought, you know, maybe I couldn't handle this dog completely, but she would, you know, she could, and, you know, together we can, we can do it. Because mm-hmm. we knew that these dogs were powerful and odd and um, and had their own personalities. And, and from what I read, didn't get along with other dogs or cats, or, you know, and I think part of that, the whole thing that I read was probably the initiation of a, of, of, you know, it's a bad idea that that I fixated on, mm-hmm. thinking that she could never get along with other dogs or cats or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think if she behaved that way, I just kind of thought it was, you know, that's the, that's her breed, that's in her genes. That, I don't know, I guess that kind of theory was already, like, in my head okay. when we got her. Mm-hmm. And there was another dog staying here at the time, my roommate's dog, and we brought her home. She was super happy, uh, very energetic, and instantly she started to kind of not get along with this dog. So within like a month of having her, we got our first trainer who worked with uh, aggressive dogs and had a, um, a, a, a bull mastiff that he used as a, um, a training guide. And he took um, him and my girlfriend when, with the bull mastiff and Yoko. They went for a long walk where they were tied together. And it was fine. It was like an hour and a half or whatever. They came back. They were all tired and just sitting in the yard. Bull mastiff's like 200 pounds or whatever. And um, I come outside to see her. And like I think within like 10 seconds, she like jumped up and did this and locked her jaw on the on the bull mastiff's like neck and the bull mastiff just started crying and like blood just like you know sprayed 
everyone else freaked out because she was just like, you know, she was uh, sitting with me on my lap at night, you know, petting her. She's she's like very sweet, very, I, I thought very good natured, you know, and I, I still think she's good natured, you know, mm-hmm. but that was the first thing that, and the first real sign of like um, aggression and um, I don't know, she was very energetic, so we always try to run her. We change our daily habits to accommodate her, early morning runs and late afternoon runs or, or jogs or whatever, and we got a variety of toys to keep her occupied because the same life. She was antsy, wanted wanted to do something, wanted to play, and she got tired and she was just like chill, like really nice, mellow, like happy dog, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing we always wanted her to be happy. Um, we try to do everything to make her happy, and the things that she was scared of, or things that from the other trainers that I walked with, they always told me just be calm, be calm. And we always constantly, whatever stuff was going on, or the dogs barking or biting or whatever, we would always just try to be calm. And uh, I didn't realize at the time that was like actually reassuring her fears or multiplying them mm-hmm. even. You know, I thought I was trying to do what I thought was the best thing for her, what I was told was the best thing for her. Um, and then I guess a couple of months after that, um, she, she was, uh, she was like sleeping on my lap or really close to me. And, um, she woke up and she looked like she was scared. And I, and I reached out to pet her tell her it's okay. Um, pet her face and, and she bit me like right in the face. Um, and, and I had to go get stitches at night. I came back. I was really, I was really unhappy that she was. She seemed the same, you know. And we just, we thought it was like night terror, like she didn't know what, you know, where she was or what she was thinking. So she was not, didn't exhibit any kind of like hostility towards me at all. It was the same as always. So we just thought she had night terrors. Um, mm-hmm. So every time we saw her like that, we would. In that state, we should wake up like any kind of weird sound or loud sound. She'd wake up and look dazed. We try to be very calm. Like, hey, Yoko, it's okay, it's okay. Like you know, constantly telling her that because we thought that was the best thing. Um, and then sometimes if she exhibited any kind of aggression, then we would kind of run because <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, we just didn't want what. Yeah, she would she would she would run after me sometimes. It was really weird because she was. Well, you know, I feel very close to her. I, I love her, but you know, I just, I just, I, I just thought of it as night terror and not like a part of her. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've heard this before, and yeah. um, you know, I want to, I want to tell you a story. And okay. uh, you know, first of all, let me say this: uh, the dog is with me now. You know, because of the baby, and you decided to relinquish the dog. I just want to let people know that, okay? And okay. Uh, I want to say that, you know, I took this case on because when you mentioned night tears, and I've had cases like this before, you know, you read about this, and you talk to doctors about this. And, you know, I've had dogs that were in charge that were alphas that I could consider to have night terrors too. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, uh, when they're sleeping and another dog comes, if they're playing and they bump into them or they touch them when they're asleep, they wake up and they become aggressive. Okay? Mm-hmm. And they do this because of how they feel where they are in the pack. I'm more dominant than you, so I'm going to discipline you for interrupting me. It's a hierarchy thing. You understand? <laughs> And and they do it all the time. And so when I read the description of night terrors and I think about what I see the dogs that are in charge do, it's the exact same thing. (laughs) And it's not night terrors. It's that this dog feels that you are beneath her. Some dogs will do that when you have them in the bed with you and you roll over and you move your feet where they're sleeping and they growl. It's how they feel about you in that relationship. Do you understand? Yeah. That's the problem you're having. Now, the fact 
that you took this dog thinking that this dog can never be with other dogs, because this is what the rescue told you, all right? Mm -hmm. Then you yeah. kept her away from being socialized with her own kind. That's a problem. And then, yeah. and then in, in the place of that, you begin to train this dog, right? Yeah. Right? And on right. top of training, you bought all the toys. You probably played tug of war with this dog. Yes. Yes. And every dog that I know of that has ever come to me that has bitten someone is a dog basically that has played tug of war. They love it to be able to challenge their leader. So they have no problem biting someone else. And when they bite their leader, their owners, it's because of where they feel they are in the hierarchy of, scheme, of the thing. You understand? And if you yeah. practice a lot of positive reinforcement, love and affection, subordinate behavior on your part, and put this dog on a pedestal, then you're going to create the very thing that you don't want. So you did, if I were to put a board on the wall and list all of the don'ts, you did them all. And you yes. never socialized the dog. So did you see the video that I put up on YouTube? Yes. Yeah, we saw it. What did you think? Amazing. It's amazing. It's uh, I've, I've actually never seen her with another dog that's even slightly bigger than her. Mm -hmm. That something bad didn't happen within 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, you have five videos, and they're uh, you know, they're anywhere from 37 seconds to a minute and seven seconds, and nothing. You know, I can see that she's a little hesitant, but she also seems happy. She's wagging her tail. She's wagging her tail, mm -hmm. and she's not exhibiting any aggressive, the, the aggressive behavior that around other animals that I'm totally used to seeing when I, you know, when we had, when we had her, mm -hmm. like from pretty much from day one, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't know if like, because we felt that, we feel, well, she, I, she tried to socialize them a little. Yeah, I mean, I would go on, we live right by Elysian Park, mm -hmm. so, you know, I don't, if you've been on that trail, yeah, it's really, it's really nice, but, um, you know, I would try to be calm and, and stuff, and, you know, people will have their dog off the leash, and they would say, oh, he's friendly, and I said, no, she's not, and they would just don't even care and run up. Their dog would just full run her, and they would just totally fight, and, mm -hmm. you know, you can't, there was nowhere to socialize her, because there was so many people with unresponsibility dogs, you know? Mm-hmm. So I mean, I mean, some, I mean, she, I mean, small dogs would come up her and you know try to fight her, but she wouldn't. She didn't want to fight those small dogs. She wanted to fight the big dogs. But mm -hmm. I mean, she was on a leash, but it was hard to socialize her. I tried, but you know, I just didn't want any more liability. As, right. You know. Yeah, I understand. But I, you know, I just want everybody, you know, everybody listening to look at the big picture here. You know, uh -huh. you started off thinking that you could never have this dog with other dogs, okay? Yeah. And and then some things happened where you actually said, okay, it's true, we really can't. But then yeah. the things that you did in place of her being able to be with other dogs, because you had already accepted it was never going to happen, was to produce uh -huh. a prey drive in your dog. And I'm sure when you, yeah. when you turn the prey drive on on this dog, it's on and popping. Am I correct? So, I mean, she's, what'd you say? I mean, she's all about it when you throw the ball and do tug of war, right? Oh, she, yeah, she loves it. She's, yeah, we used, to, oh, yeah. we used to have this, like, fishing pole thing with a little... You know, like the cat thing? Yeah, like, yeah. Cat like thing. the cat thing. We'd have her, and we'd, you know, it was, like, funny to us. Because she would chase it like She would crazy. chase it like, you know, like it was prey, and we did that. That was probably her favorite. We did play tug of war as well, and she liked that a lot. Right. She didn't really like the ball, but she loved anything that looked like a small cat or, you know, like a small animal. And we'd get her these yeah, things. She would shake it. And she would shake it. She'd yeah. destroy it. And, and we would pretty much just kind of laugh because it, it looked funny. Right. But, it, I mean, obviously, it's everything that you preach against. Every, yeah. <laughs> every one of those things we did, and we did multiple times, and we did it out of love, and we did it because we wanted her to be happy. And, and 
Yeah, I know. Yeah. It, it, you did it out of love. And you know, you know, there's been some saying about this dog, the way this dog's head is shaped. And they probably told you this, or you may have read it in regards to how it forms their brain. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what it what they say is that it, it it squeezes their brain. Is that what you read? Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's what I read. Well, well, here's the thing. Okay, let's just say that that's true. Okay. Okay. And then the brain size is small and it's squished. And then mm-hmm. the only thing that you allow in that brain is something that produces killing. Then what kind of dog do yeah. you think you're going to have? You know? <laughs> you you got to... <laughs> there's no room for yeah. anything else because there's nothing as passionate as the thing that you were doing. Yeah. You know? So... Yeah. If this were true, I'm saying, if the scientists are right, if they're right, yeah. if people are listening, and you've got these dogs, if that's true, mm-hmm. be careful what you put in there. Because yeah. the quality of your life with your dog is going to diminish to your house. And every yeah. time you step out of there, you're going to be on pins and needles. That's exactly, that's exactly what happened. The yeah. quality of our life with our diminished as the years went on because she became more neurotic and more controlling. Oh, anxiety was really bad too, though. And her anxiety, I didn't realize it was out of her because we didn't create a role for her, the role that she needed. Wait, it, made her, it made her, like I guess, anxious and not right. sure of herself. She yeah. spent a lot of time under things, under beds, under tables, by herself. You know, whereas before we'd be like... You know, Yoko, let's go for a walk. And she'd jump up and, and be ready to go. Now she'd kind of look at you and be like, I don't know, not right now, dude. You know, like, yeah, this dog was to- totally in control of you guys. She had produced mm-hmm. she had produced fear in you. She had bitten yeah. you. She was in total control. And when they do that, they decide what they want to do. So mm-hmm. I, I wanted to have you on because I wanted people to hear your story. And, and you know, luckily for her, you are able to relinquish her to me. And the reason I wanted to take her is because it was an interesting case, because I always are interested in cases because I want to prove, uh, you know, that this thing is not what the medical society says that it is. It's really a case of socialization, you know, and yeah. that they're fear, fearful. And uh, yeah. so I'm happy that you came on to, you know, express your journey with listeners and, uh you know, watch the videos, and you can call me whenever you want. I'll give you updates of what's happening. Um, because you, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Would so you don't think she's an alpha male? No, no. Right now we're still. You know, I'm taking my time in evaluating her, but uh, no, I think yeah. this is a dog that's totally misunderstood. She doesn't know what she should be doing, and that's where you have a problem. Okay. Okay. So anyway, I want to thank you again for coming on the Fouché Way Radio Show. I want to thank all of our guests, and I want you to tune in next time, Thursday at 1 o'clock p.m., where we will be talking about the aggression nature of dogs. Thank you very much. You're listening to Fouché Way with Brandon Fouché, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. We suggested that. You know what else to do, you know. Alpha's are not fearful. 